came up on the very delayed 7 o'clock train last night. Thank you. Welcome. I think we're going to get started. I'm going to try to get started. So welcome to tonight's event. Uh, welcome to the Center on National Security at Fordham Law. I want to begin tonight by thanking our partner, our co-host in tonight's event, which is um, Pan America Center, and its executive director, Suzanne Nossel, who helped us put this together. Um, we're very excited to be partnering with them for the second time in a very short uh, period of time. You know that Pen America is devoted to free expression and to anything that, and to addressing any issues that impede free expression. So they are a very good partner for the center to work with, and we are grateful to have them here tonight. This is a, there you go. This is a, this this is a very exciting evening for us. Um, we've wanted to address the topic of the NSA of Edward Snowden and what's become known as the Edward Snowden issue. Uh, there are very few people who get to have issues named after them um, so, and, and who get to have the President of the United States mention them twice uh, in their major policy speeches. So it's a topic that I think the Center is going to be addressed for a addressing for a long time coming. What we're going to be debating here tonight is how to assess what should be done in the case of Snowden in terms of his culpability. We're going to address, as a result, many other issues, but we wanted to focus on the one that's sort of at the edges of the debate. Will there be clemency? Should there be clemency? What would it mean to have clemency? I think one of the reasons that so many people are interested in this debate is not just the free expression matter, but just what has happened to the United States in the war on terror. And this is one more iteration, the surveillance issue, of what the United States government did often uh, secretly, often in violation of uh, constitutional rights, often illegally, to try to protect the American people. And so in a way, I guess we're stuck in this debate for a long time to come.
For many of us, the surveillance issue is one that we didn't know about until the middle of the uh, first Bush presidency. Um, and every year we're finding out more and more. So I'm not really sure, and I don't think anyone here is where this story is going to go. Um, we have a stellar group of uh, speakers tonight. Amy Davidson from The New Yorker, Jonathan Capehart from The Washington Post and from MSNBC frequently. Um, but I want to spend a few minutes talking about our moderator, David McCraw, who has been here before and it is my pleasure to invite back. And I, I want to tell you why. He is the Assistant General Counsel at the New York Times. Can you imagine? What a great job to have in this day and age. <laughs> um, so other than the obvious, one of the things that he is responsible for is FOIA litigation. And so he has had the pleasure or the responsibility, however you would like to assess it, of having to do the, or getting to do the FOIA litigation on things like the um, targeted killing programs and where is the memo that the United States government produced that uh, the public still does not have. He's also been involved in the FOIA litigation for uh, documents from the Pentagon that had to do with using former officials to uh, spread the word about uh, the government's position in the media. He's also been involved in FOIA litigation that had to do with getting secret tapes from the first responders from 9-11. So he's covered the gamut of national security issues and freedom of information and what the public needs to know in a way very few people have. So I think he's the perfect moderator for tonight and I hope to have him back. But David, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that when Karen does that introduction, she doesn't reveal how many of those cases I lost. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it, yeah, and I mean, when I was asked to do this, of course, I was happy to be on the stage with, with Jonathan and Amy, who have written about this issue so vibrantly and in such interesting ways. Um, but it reminded me that uh, this past summer, I was in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, doing a seminar for law students. I happened to run into an American couple while I was there, and they invited me out for dinner. Went out to dinner with their two children, and their eight-year-old daughter, we're sitting outside at this restaurant in the Black Sea, and their eight-year-old daughter keeps turning to her mother and says, Mommy, can I ask the man the question? No, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Mommy, can I ask the man the question? So we get into dinner, and finally, Mom says, ask the question. And this eight-year-old girl, American girl, living in the Republic of Georgia says, Edward Snowden, hero or criminal? <laughs> now, I was struck by several things at that moment. One is, isn't that amazing, the reach of that? You know, here we are, millions of miles from America, this eight-year-old girl had, had this question. The second one, the one thing I was passionate about, why do, why do people bring their kids to dinner to ask embarrassing questions of adults? <laughs> That's a really bad form. Uh, and, and the third thing was, you know, the, how complicated this question is for me. I spend a lot of time swimming in these waters, and it's a very simple question. It's very complex. And so, uh, fortunately, I, I did come up with what you say to an eight-year-old in that situation, which is, is there a third choice? And she, <laughs> that shut her up. Uh, I don't think we're going to have that reaction tonight. Uh, fortunate to have people who have spoken so compellingly about this issue. My role as, as moderator here is really just to facilitate the discussion. I will, of course, oversimplify and make a mess of their positions, which are very nuanced in order to be provocative, but they can, they can set me straight. So uh, what I'd like to start with, uh, and we haven't gone over any of the questions here. This is going to be um, a fairly spontaneous discussion. But we did agree that it would be good for each of them to spend a few minutes just sort of outlining their position before I make a hash of it. So Amy, you want to begin? Um, sure. And thank you. And hello. Um, I, I think that just to, in a way, start with the question you were asked, the hero or criminal question. What struck me when you said that was that those are really two things in different categories. Criminal is about specific things that you've done that violate a law or don't. Hero tends to be about character. And I think that that's where the discussion gets really confused for a lot of people. I tend to think that there are, there's not just one case for, let's say, amnesty or clemency. I think, as a side note, that we get 
I'm not a lawyer, and we get these words all confused, um, whether it's amnesty or clemency or just a deal that would allow Edward Snowden to not spend the rest of his life in jail. So should we agree to just conflate all of those, those things a little bit? I'm all um, about conflation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, when, um, so when I say clemency, say that that doesn't necessarily, that can mean a couple of, of different things. It could mean a plea bargain in some way that some people would see as generous and others would see as just perfectly just. Um, but again, I think that there are two cases for that that go in different directions. And in a way, um, the supporters of each are, I think, put off um, by the other to an extent that makes it almost hard to arrive at a deal. Um, one of them, I think you could say, is you know the case of what Edward Snowden has done for America broadly. There's this you know, the idea that he's He's started a discussion that nobody else could, at risk to himself. Uh, the president himself said that he made the country stronger. Uh, he'd gotten information out when our normal mechanisms in Congress and in the courts had failed to, and that in a way he's earned his freedom. That's one very emotional case for people. Um, the other side you might call what Edward Snowden could still do for the government. And there's an argument here that he, that it's not in anybody's interest that he's, you know, a fugitive and out there. The government still does not have a good sense, so it's been reported, of what he has or how exactly he got it. One can imagine a plea deal that involves him sort of helping them rein some things in explain what happened, explain how it happened, how perhaps they could make their security a little bit better so that all of our information that's in government hands doesn't sort of walk out the door and learn some lessons from it and so that there could be real benefits to the government from coming to some understanding with him. Now, again, I think that the problem is that the people who's in the government who've talked about um, how he should be, you know, hung by his neck, how he should be shot, they're so deranged by what they see as just the wrongness of the first argument, that he's done something good for America and he deserves this, that in a way they don't even, are not even quite able to think about the country's and the government's practical interest in not having him sort of stranded in Russia not having, you know, this lack of knowledge out of there, leaving it only to reporters to, and I believe reporters are, you know, working really hard to, when they go through these papers, not actually, you know, damage or hurt people with what they publish. So, you know, there's a way that that, that side can. Now, the other side, the side that um, loves Snowden, is grateful to him, sees what he's done for the country, is, I think, in some ways quite uncomfortable with the other argument that I outlined and wonders like, I, I wonder even if there's a point where some of Snowden's supporters would want him to turn down certain sorts of deals that guaranteed his freedom um, because the idea that there's anything but complete transparency about it um, or any kind of negotiation or that he might have to admit or con you know acknowledge law-breaking or acknowledge, acknowledge guilt or culpability in some way seems so radically unfair that that's a discussion they don't quite want to have. So in other words, I think that there's, there's these two cases I don't think have been, I don't think they've been brought together properly because of the emotions that so many people have and what they see is just the, and you know, have reasons to see as the unfairness and the justice and the patriotism that comes into the assessment of what he's done in every way. So I think that that, in a way, I, I think that finding a way to some sort of clemency should, in a way, be really easy because it's in both sides, everybody's interests. But um, and yet, it's so hard to talk about without people just throwing up their hands and saying. 
but he's a bad person, and or but he's a hero, and without talking about what is actually good for the country. Don't throw up your hands, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Amy said something to me um, when we met just outside that probably I think is accurately describes um, me on this on this issue, and and I loved what you said about this discussion. Um, the one that we're all having around the country and around the world as an emotional one, which I have, which I have not heard. And Amy said to me that, uh, as we were talking about this debate, um, and I thought, I can't debate this because I'm all over the place. And she said, well, in your writing, you've been having a debate with yourself. And that's true, because this isn't a hero or criminal um, conversation for me. Uh, I come at this with a mixed mind. First and foremost, I'm a journalist, and as a journalist, I'm all about access to information. I think the American people deserve to know, need to know, ought to know, should know what the government is doing in uh, on its behalf in terms of protecting them, protecting us, and protecting our safety. Um, you know, I think in that regard, what Edward Snowden has done has been an incredible service to the country because now we know what the NSA has been doing all these years, and it's it's rather breathtaking what the NSA has been able to do. Um, but then I come at this from the perspective of as an American, as a citizen, and I look at what Edward Snowden has done, and I wonder, okay, well. Why didn't you go to Congress with this? With all the people on Capitol Hill who would love nothing better than to bury this president, there is no one on the Hill, in the House or the Senate, of any stature you could have gone to, taken this to, um, and gotten this information out that way. Um, why, didn't, why didn't he stay? And, and face the consequences after revealing this information? Why did he leave Hawaii and go to Hong Kong slash China? Why then did he go to Russia? And I'm not engaging in the debate of whether he, this, I think, silly debate about whether he's a spy that, I, that has popped up. That's not my concern. I don't think Edward, Edward Snowden is a spy, but I do wonder why he did not stay here, do what he did, and face the consequences. Um, and I keep thinking about, and people have made the connection and the comparison with Daniel Ellsberg. Um, Mr. Ellsberg himself has said that Edward Snowden is in his model, you know, follows in his footsteps. And I can see why he would say that. But then, you know, in writing the pieces that I've written, going back and reading about Ellsberg's history, to my mind, made Ellsberg a hero by comparison. Daniel Ellsberg went to Congress. And when members of Congress would do nothing about it, he went to the New York Times. When the, New, when the New York Times was shut down in printing the Pentagon Papers, he went to the Washington Post. We printed those, pen, printed the Pentagon Papers. Um, and it was, when that was shut down, he got those papers out to other newspapers around the country. Two, Daniel Ellsberg also went into hiding. But he didn't leave the country. He was in hiding in Cambridge. <laughs> he was here in the United States. And then when he, um, uh, when the, the pressure got really intense, he turned himself in. He went to the US Attorney's Office in Boston. He, he held himself accountable. He um, uh, faced the music, for lack of a better description, um, for what he did. And Edward Snowden hasn't, didn't do any of those things, and so, that's why, <laughs> Amy, when you see, you see my writing, there is this debate within myself because I understand and appreciate what he's done, what Edward Snowden has done, but um, there's a part of me that is extremely troubled by, by what he's done and, what, and the impact that, it's, that it has had and will continue to have on the country because as Amy pointed out and has been reported, not even the federal government knows exactly what Edward Snowden took with him, what journalists have in their hands, and you're right, 
I mean, I know at the paper, I mean, I'm on the editorial board, so I don't know um, what Barton Gelman has in the decision making that's gone into you know, what's been reported, but this much I do know, they are being very careful and very judicious about what they're releasing because, you know, ultimately, I mean, do, does anyone want to be responsible for compromising national security in a, in a serious way? So, um, um, the discussion on clemency, uh, some sort of plea bargain for, for Edward Snowden, I'd be curious as to what that is, but I do think Amy is right that uh, Edward Snowden needs to come home and I, I would love to see what that deal, what that deal looks like, but uh, I, I think that Edward Snowden should come back to the United States and be held accountable, whatever, however accountability is defined. Yeah, of course, you don't ask the most troubling question about his behavior, why didn't he come to the New York Times, which is un <laughs> unforgivable behavior <laughs> by a true American. But Amy, you want to you respond to that? Um, you know, there, you raised a, a few things. Um, it's funny because people often say, you know, why didn't he go to Congress? Um, when I think if you've been following this issue, one of the things that is most clearly come out is that Congress really failed and was failed uh, in terms of oversight and disclosure. And one thing I've written about before is that if you had to pick out a single moment that most made the case for clemency of some kind for Snowden, it would be when Senator Wyden asked James Clapper, um, Director of National Intelligence, you know, pretty directly, you know, is there collection of data, of mil any sort of data on millions of, from millions of Americans? And he just, he said no. And he very clearly, if you look at the transcript, lied. And I think that it's really impossible to make the, if only he'd gone to Congress, it all would have worked argument, given what's happened in Congress in terms of oversight. You could also say, you know, lying to Congress is a crime as well. And that's, that's that nobody's really talked about, in, in a way we have these sort of pocket clemencies for officials who have also committed crimes in the course in the course of this, so I'm I, I I don't quite see. I think that there were, as you say, members of Congress who'd struggled with this issue and they had not succeeded, just and like, they had not been able to succeed partly because, as Wyden, Wyden was felt very constrained by what he could say about classified information right. that he had seen. And this gets to a question as you were talking, what, um, and let's just. Um, um, play this out. Let's say um, Edward Snowden went to Wyden, because Wyden has been on, had been on the record for a long Wyden, time. Wyden had seen some of these things and had knowledge of them, but was unable to speak about them and unable to get them to the public through the means that we've been talking about. But, but, so my question is, what would have happened if a third party, meaning a Snowden, had gone to Senator Wyden and said, I've got this. Then what could the senator have? What could the senator what have done? Do we did. have any? He could do have, have done what he did in an open hearing with an official, asked a question designed to start the debate that we needed to have, and been openly lied to. I, I think that that's it's really hard to say. And you know, we expect everybody to be perfectly wise about the whole galaxy of choices that they have. That's not entirely realistic. And again, we're not quite talking, the subject here is, is Edward Snowden perfect? And has every judgment and every step he's made worked? You know, I mean, it sounds sort of obvious to say, but we wouldn't be talking about amnesty or clemency if he hadn't committed very serious crimes. You don't need clemency right. if you haven't committed a crime. So that, that I think is, is clear. Things had, have happened, but we have these mechanisms like amnesty, clemency, plea bargains, because we, we realize that sometimes there are issues that you have to sort of, you have these two things and you have to find a way to make them work together and they don't naturally. I, let, 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 me, let me just jump in here for a second because Jonathan raised a lot of things about Edward Snowden's behavior that, that concern people. 
And do those count in your calculus of whether he's entitled to clemency or not? I, you know, is his behavior I, I, relevant? You know, we talk, talk about conflating things. And one thing that I think's really been conflated is the idea of, you know, hero, patriot, and martyr. I, I don't think that that part of it is, is what we necessarily need to ask of people. I also wonder, um, you know, Daniel Ellsberg, by the way, was spared conviction because of a finding of government misbehavior in it. We have all of these mechanisms in the law to find ways not to convict people if we think that there's bad government behavior on, on the other side in some ways. But that's, aside from that, I think, I think that it's, it's um, you know, the question of should he have come back and faced the music? Did he need to do that in order for this to be, a, for him to be a nice man, for this to be a story where he's deserving of clemency? I don't quite see it that way. I don't, I don't see why that's an element of it. Um, part, you know, one of the issues is that I'm not actually convinced that he could do what he had done. If he had immediately turned himself in the day after this came out, I don't think that we necessarily would have heard a word that he said about his motives, at least in the short term. I don't know that, that it would have had that same access to what he said, or he, if journalists would have been able to have the same conversations with him. So, I mean, that's, that's another question. And Jonathan, let, let's, let's pick up on the Ellsberg point, because you've raised this in your writings, you've raised it here, and, of course, you hate when this happens. Daniel Ellsberg said he did the right thing by running. <laughs> Daniel Ellsberg has now said that. Daniel Ellsberg right. said that because he said, you know, I walked into that Cambridge courtroom, I walked out that day, okay, and I never went to jail pending trial. Look at what happened to Private Manning. But follow, why does it matter Snowden's behavior, shouldn't it be judged by whether, in fact, it's been good for the American public to know these things? But that's not, uh, that can't be the, that can't be the only thing. Um, here's a, uh, I mean, it gets to, the word that comes to mind is, is credibility. Um, one of the things that people are trying to do to um, erode his, uh, Edward Snowden's credibility is now this charge that he's a Russian spy to try to diminish the import of what he did in terms of awakening the American people to the incredible things that the National Security Administration has been doing in their name. Um, I, that's why I think his, his behavior is is important. I mean, I think he could have done those interviews that he did with Barton Gelman at the Washington Post and Glenn Greenwald at the Guardian, the, the videotaped interviews that he did and release all those papers and still turn and still turn himself in. Because by then people would have heard he would have been able to say his piece, his motivations, everything that he said, uh, and then uh, be held accountable. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I understand and recognize and certainly appreciate that the world Daniel Ells, that the, the world Daniel Ellsberg operated in and where he released the Pentagon Papers and he walked into that Cambridge courtroom and walked out the same day is not the same world that Edward Snowden is in. And I know that, um, and I'm perfectly aware and appreciate that um, the fate that could Befall, could have befallen him is the same one that ha happened to Chelsea Manning, um, but we'll never. But, but we'll never know. Amy, I mean, let me let me take that same question. Isn't is there something that you could find out about Snowden that would be your okay? I'm going to go there. Your your Chris Christie moment where you go, oh man, I can't believe I've been taking the position. I've been. See, I'm I mean, glad you. I almost used Chris Christie as okay. part I mean, of an example. You know, if you found out that he actually had provided information to the Russians or engaged in other acts that we would all reasonably agree which were spying, would, is the deal off the you know, table? It's, it's, I, it's so hypothetical. I, you know, I understand it's, it's that. Saying if, if this case is different from the case that we have facts about in front of us now, and, and we're, we're speculating widely if it turns out that he poisons kittens, I mean, I, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard to, to say. I, I mean, 
I, I'd like to but see it, those. But it, those I think first. it really goes to the bigger question of what are the rules for the next Edward Snowden? Well, see, this gets to a funny thing about the question of, of clemency and pardons and the next Edward Snowden. We've been talking as though this is a really priceless commodity, this kind of deal or this kind of mercy, that we need to make sure that he's a good man, a man who's done no harm, a man who's impeccable in some ways. And yet, in our history, we've given pardons and clemencies a lot. You know, the Secretary of Defense for lying to Congress, Casper Weinberger, there, a lot of people were pardoned in Iran-Contra. And I don't think that there was actually a whole, you know, finding that, every, that they had never done anything wrong, that they had never harmed the country in any way. I think that Iran-Contra did harm the country. And, you know, and, but there was a decision that it made sense to move to the next stage of a national conversation through that. You know, after we've, we pardon people, you know, draft dodgers, Confederate soldiers, you know, the Whiskey Rebellion. We've done this in our history, and it's always been because we've thought about whether what just happened has gotten us to a place where we want to be as a country. And if then having a huge trial or punishing people, um, who've done a lot of bad things. You know, I'm not talking about Snowden specifically, but we've pardoned bad people in our country's history when we've had the sense that it makes the country stronger. Not always, you know, and I would say that we haven't always made the right choices and they haven't, it hasn't always been, you know, a good story. I mean, George Steinbrenner got a pardon for federal crimes at, at one point. America so. got better the day Mark Rich got pardoned, and don't say it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, 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 you know, I mean, maybe Yankees fans do feel that that is a pardon that made America stronger. I don't know if I totally agree, but, um, and I don't think that it, it was given with the sense that he was a perfect man. Um, and so... I, I guess I shy away from that sort of angle, and I certainly do from sort of some of the hypotheticals, you know, of whether he got the best advice in terms of where he should buy his next plane ticket. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting separate question. But shouldn't we be, I mean, shouldn't we be concerned about what happened when he was in Hong Kong, in the transit area in Russia, um, about what the what government officials in those respective countries did, to and, and and shouldn't we be concerned when he says to Brazil, if you give me, if if you give me asylum, I'll help you? Yeah, I don't. I think that that, that might be a little oversimplification of what he. That's what I'm here for. He wrote there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, look, we've got a guy who's what 29, 30 years old. He's got to spend the rest of his life somewhere. Um, and we need to, you know, if he's saying, I'm, I got to get out of Russia, Brazil, take me, you know, this, these are, and again, I'm not like holding up a big, like, you know, insta free without any converse, conversation sort of sign. I think that it, what makes sense is having these conversations and coming to some outcome that, that, uh, makes sense for, but are, are you concerned about the questions Jonathan raised about what actually happened? I mean, you know, there's one way to find that out, and that's for him and his lawyers to have a conversation with the U.S. government and, you know, figure it out and come to some sort of arrangement or deal or some, you know, I, and I think that they might be able to ask him, but who knows? You know, it, it, the but I, I haven't actually, I feel like, you know, it's funny, there are a lot of reports around, um, you know, when we ran, Jane Mayer had a conversation with Edward Snowden on encrypted channels a couple of days ago in which he very vehemently denied the whole what happened in Hong Kong scenario. Um, so there's, there's that, you know, and I, I just haven't seen, a lot of people have been chasing that story and I don't, I haven't seen them right. well, get it there. I, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd like both of you to react to what the president said to uh, New Yorker editor David Remnick when he said, you, you know, that, this, that the leaks raise legitimate policy questions, but is the only way to do that by giving some 29-year-old free reign to basically dump a mountain of information 
much of which is definitely legal, definitely necessary for national security and should be classified. I mean, if the, if the positive outcome here is the debate, did we need all, all the other things, all In, the other disclosures? I mean, we didn't have it before. And, um, you know, it's sort of a, another <clears throat> sort of strange, you know, Obama's sort of take on this seems to be, if you guys had just given me time, I would have gotten to it and I would have started this debate. But the reality is that we didn't have this debate before the disclosures. I'd also say that one thing that we've learned in the course of this is that maybe too much is classified um, and that there are things that we've learned. It's not only that we've learned secrets um, and it's not only that we've learned secret law, which I think is one of the most important parts of this. Um, you know, learning some of the Edward Snowden revelations have really been about how the government reads the law, things that aren't operational, aren't even about programs. They're really about, about what words mean and that really did need to be out there. And so it should never have been classified in, in the first place. Um, so maybe one thing when the president is asking, does it have to be that a 29-year-old has free reign to dump all of this information? Um, one wonders why there's so much classified information, so much that a 29-year-old has access to. And that's sort of part, part of the, the government wants to ask a question of itself about overclassification to the extent that it has to give so many people access to it to do their jobs um, and about its own security. Those are good questions. I'm not sure that they're the questions that are for, are, have to do with um, what happens legally to Snowden now. Um, in that Remnick interview, which I read in its entirety on the train up, if you haven't read it yet, it's 32 printed pages. Um, but one of the things that comes across, um, and is something that if you've been paying attention and and paying attention to the president as a reader um, and a, as a reporter, paying attention to him as someone covered. This is a this is a, a man who campaigned one way. I'm going to close Guantanamo Bay. I'm going to end the wars, which he's successfully doing. I'm going to do all these things that the American people want. Let's campaign. He gets into the White House, and now he gets to see all the stuff he was not able to see as a candidate. Um, now he's president. And in that quote, what I saw was sort of the constitutional law professor who understands and, know, and knows the law and thinks that things should happen a certain way, smack up against the duties and responsibilities of commander in chief. You know, and, so now, and so now he's faced with, um, and I think he says in the interview, my number one job is to keep the American people safe. And so he's getting these daily briefings. He's got the intelligence reports. He sees the, the hell and mayhem that none of us, thankfully, get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when he says, though, that you know, the NSA is doing things that are, that are legal, and you mentioned the FISA court, well, the FISA court's a secret court. So a secret court is declaring what the NSA has done is being legal, but we don't know really the rationale behind why the FISA court says these things are legal. Um, so, you know, hell, if I'm having a, date, a debate within myself in my writing, imagine what it must be like for, for this particular president given, given who he is. It's funny because the, this sort of journey that Obama has taken, you know, from the guy who wanted to reign in the NSA to the one who faced with the responsibilities, you know, let them do a lot more, is often sort of talked about as, as a positive journey. Um, and I'm not sure it is, you know, but I, I also think that the president doesn't discredit the constitutional law professor. We all have roles here. And if he's fulfilling one role and the Congress is fulfilling another and the press is another, you know, one way that our system recalibrates when one of those, one body in it goes too far is by others going too far or others pushing. And I think that that pushing is, you know, we just got to a moment where that in some ways was ready to happen. And the means it happened by was Edward Snowden. It was not 
strangely, the one that some people thought it would be, the election of Barack Obama. It wasn't, you know, we didn't get to that point in our post 9-11 uh, recalibration by electing a constitutional law professor, but we got to it. And that I think is in some ways a tribute to the many means that we have to get there. It's, you know, and the many, you know, the role of the press, the many ways that we do have to sort of reel things back. But, but let me put the president's remark in a broader context, which is, isn't there something really scary about a system where we're going to put the decision in the hands of somebody like Edward Snowden to, and, that, and then not punish him, right? I mean, you're going to have to, you're obviously going to have to put classified information in the hands of people who can, I'm not going to bring up the oath word, but can, <laughs> I've read it, uh, but in violation of their duty to their employer or to their country, they release it. And, and if you don't have punishment in that system, how do you keep from having leaks that hurt? You, I mean, you know, you might also ask if you don't have punishment for the NSA overreaching, how are they not going to? If you don't have punishment for anybody who's been involved in illegal detentions or torture, and we really haven't, you know, that, that that's a question that comes up a lot. But I also think that it's it's the thing that puzzles me about that is what exactly do we see as punishment? I mean, are we going to feel better about this if, you know, Edward Snowden has a sort of time in solitary confinement that Chelsea Manning did say, or, you know, I mean, it's clear that Edward Snowden, nobody's talking about giving him a villa in Hawaii and having him sort of, you know, rewarded forever. I think he's, it's not as though we should just keep in mind he hasn't given up anything. You know, he had a life before and he has a very different life now. Um, whether that's adequate, but I wonder who we are satisfying when we talk about, you know, punishment in that way. I also really do wonder if any of these things are true deterrence. All that the punishment of Chelsea Manning did was cause Edward Snowden to decide that he had to flee the country, you know, and, and um, so, so that didn't stop him from doing this. I think that the real deterrent, if we're worried again about this, and I've said this before and I'm slightly obsessed with it, but, you know, we, is overclassification, which is why all of these slightly random young people have access to so much information, because there's so much that's classified at a high level that, you know, you need to give, for the government to function, you have to give a, a shocking number of people top, you know, high security clearances. So I, I think in terms of how do we prevent the next Edward Snowden, how do we prevent like all of our very private information from being like suddenly revealed with no punishment, you know, there are, it's, it's, there are ways to address that, I think, um, that don't have to do with long jail sentences. Do you want to speak to the punishment point, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Edward Snowden should be held accountable. Um, should he go to Club Fed? Um, with I don't, Clapper. With Clapper, we're, we're down with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I, mean, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I do that think... That would make Amy, Amy happy for there. Okay. I mean, part, part of, of being held accountable or, or punishment is to let the next person know, here's what's going to happen if if you do this again. And I think just sort of institutionally, the federal government and the, and, and, and the administration wants to send the signal that, I mean, hey, you other Edward Snowden wannabes, don't even think about this happening. The, idea, the fact that Edward Snowden is, you know, living outside the country, yeah, he's given up a lot, he's left his family, he's left his livelihood, so on and so forth, but he's not... Yeah, He's true. not in jail. There, there are other, and I, and I hasten to say that it's true that some people like that yeah, kind of thing. Some, and for you know, some and, people, and, I mean. You know, and, and, but I would say that, you know, we keep talking, when the government says we need to prevent the next Edward Snowden, I wonder exactly what they mean. Do they just mean somebody who releases a lot of things that happen to have a high security clearance, or think somebody who releases things that embarrass the government you know, cause people to be angry and get us to question 
you know, how yeah. our state institutions are operating. Because if you want to prevent the next Edward Snowden, maybe make sure that your uh, intelligence agencies aren't spying on Americans. And, 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 and you know, that's, well, that's probably the best, the best way because if, if there was nothing to reveal, there wouldn't be an Edward Snowden in that well, sense. It's not just the I, classification of the documents he released that makes him what he is. John, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm completely with you on the government's overclassification of documents, which is something that um, goes back to the Bush administration um, and hasn't been curtailed by the Obama administration. But when I talk about preventing the next Edward Snowden, a couple of the other things that trouble me about what he's done is he was only at his last job for three months. The, the agency, Booz Allen, that, I'm sorry, the agency that vetted him, that did the background check, um, if I, I remember correctly, today is under investigation by the federal government for doing botched background checks for thousands of people. Right. There are thousands of people employed by, or as contractors, not even employed by the federal government, employed by a third party who have high security, high security clearances who could be the next person to walk out the door with thousands upon thousands of documents um, that embarrass the government, that endanger national security, that could mean nothing because, as you've, as you've rightly said, so many, um, so many documents that the government has uh, are, are stamped classified when they really don't need to be. So that's my, that, that's the thing about, about Snowden, that the, the idea that he was in that job for three months as a contractor, uh, um, his background check being botched by another, by another entity, and he was able to have access to unbelievable amounts of information. Well, you know, and, 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 and the last time I was here, I, I obviously spoke to this point that the leak prosecutions, I think, are a real danger to democracy. Overclassification is an incredible danger to democracy. The government has brought on a lot of this themselves. And uh, you, you look at the NSA and you say, who are the people they should have been watching? Edward Snowden and the two guys who blew up the Boston Marathon. And the Russians are going, that's the guy. You know, <laughs> that's the guy you should watch him. And instead, they're collecting millions and millions of uh, records about other people and apparently not finding the bad guys. That said, though, I, despite my, my position on all those issues, it troubles me that there is a disclosure as a result of this that the Swedes are helping us spy on the Russians because I think the Russians should be spied on. They are human right violators. And if the Swedes are going to help us, let them. Okay. And that's the thing that concerns me is that why is that report out there and, and should we have a system that allows that? Well, see, I mean, th that's, the other th th that's the other thing uh, about all this. I, I understand that diplomacy and especially espionage because that's what it is, needs, you know, a bit of secrecy. There are lots of things that the government does, does on our behalf that, um, we don't know about and we shouldn't know about and the folks who were doing this doing this too shouldn't know about it because guess what? They're doing it to us. Um, when the president of Brazil flipped out and got mad because she found out that the NSA had been spying on her cell phone, I completely get that. I mean, no one wants to be spied on their cell phone or the German Chancellor Angela Merkel finding out that the NSA was spying on her cell phone I get that, but then we find out a few weeks down the road that the Brazilians were spying on us. And I know from, from um, friends in the government that this sort of cross-national spying, even, uh, even among our friends, I won't, name, I won't name the embassy, but a friend of mine worked at a major embassy in a major country, and there is a room in the embassy that is lined it's like a, a plastic tent where if they're going to have class of conversations that they don't want to be overheard, like guaranteed or as much as they could, that they won't be overheard, they go into this plastic tent within a room to minimize, you know, spying. I this is in the country of a friend. So the idea that 
you know, what the, what the NSA is doing or has done or continues to do is something that only they are doing is ridiculous. I, I, you know, I, I think, first of all, that when we talk about some deal for Snowden, part of that deal wouldn't be repealing laws on classified information or on the foreign spying that the NSA can do. Um, I think that the interesting thing about some of, and what's striking about some of the revelations about foreign spying, um, you know, in some ways we, in some areas we learn ways that the NSA has kind of gotten in the way of the Constitution, or the, you know, sort of compromise the Constitution at home, and then we learn just that they've been very clumsy abroad. There's been sort of, and that's, you know, that's good to know, because if they're not being watched, if there's not oversight, if they're possibly bungling foreign policy by being a little too clumsy and a little too greedy and a little too not surgical enough, you know, it's good to know. I mean, that's also one of those points where you just decide that any government agency ought to be run better. And I think that that, that's, you know, I, I agree that it's not an absolute scandal that we're spying on foreign countries. But, you know, if we're doing it in a dumb way that's going to make it harder for us to get information, you know, that's, that's another sort of problem, but it's also a problem, I think. Do you, do you think that the, this incident with the Snowden documents has been an indictment of, of mainstream media? Has, have they, have, has their failure, as some people suggested, after 9-11, to really hold the government accountable, created. I mean, I think I think the media has done a lot of. When you when one says the media, you know, I, you know, Jonathan and I are, and you we're all part of the media. That's that's, that's why I'm that. looking for you to say something <laughs> really flattering. So, the answer is no where, to my question. This is, where, this is where I have to be held accountable and you know pay but, the price. But um, um, no, I mean, I think that the media is is has done some really really important things. Um, since 9-11, and I think it's missed some really, really important things, and that's always going to be true. Um, but I think that it's uh, been, uh, in this area, kind of kind of helpful. Are you going to agree what with that? What she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that brings, I guess, around to the, to the, the public part of this. And, and, and you saw, I'm sure, that the, the Pew results came out the other day. And they're, they're sort of strange in that if you, if you look at the actual numbers, because, you know, right now, according to the Pew uh, research, 45% of the people think that the disclosures serve the public interest, 43% think not. Uh, the rest are there dining with eight-year-olds in Georgia trying to figure out what to think. <laughs> but, but even though 45% of the people think that they, the public interest was served, 56% think there should be a criminal case. And you sort of try to wrap your head around those numbers. But does it matter? I mean, is, is, is the public opinion on this surprise you? And, and well, what should you I, make I of it? I think that should there be a criminal case, is that how the question That's was? That's how the question was phrased, yeah. You know, there is a criminal case. Again, this is, I mean, that can mean so many things. Like, there should be a criminal case, but I hope he only gets three months. There should be a criminal case, and I hope he's executed. Both of those sentiments exist, and they're both covered by that answer. So, and so the real argument now is if we all assume that some crimes have been committed, and I don't think there's anybody who thinks that no crime has been committed, it's just a matter of whether it's a crime that was, you know, helpful in the best interest of the country, had all these mitigating things, then how do we, what's the disposition of that? How do we move forward thinking about that? And Luckily, we happen to have a criminal justice system that has mechanisms for that, where, you know, pardon and clemency and plea bargain, those aren't terms we have to invent for this case. Those aren't things like special Snowden Golden Star dispensation that we have to suddenly come up with now. They exist, and they exist for a reason. Uh, I like I like that Q, that Q poll because as you read it, I thought, oh wow, I'm actually with those folks. <laughs> For, I, yes, I think the public disclosure is great. Yes, 
I think he should be, when I, when I hear should be, what was the question, should be criminally? So there should be, whether there should be a criminal case. Whether there should be a criminal case, I take that to mean, I, I, I wonder if the people who were, who were queried took that to mean held accountable. And so if that's the case, then, you know, I, I'm there too. I think that this is the public disclosure. Um, I support the public disclosure, but I also think that he should be held accountable for what he's done. Because as we've all discussed, and as you said, he, he's broken laws. So, um, but what do, you, what do you mean by that? Do you see him coming back, he, back to the United States, standing trial and putting the system on trial? Putting the law on trial? I mean, why not? I well, mean, let's, I, I mean, he says in all of his interviews that he's that he has done this so that we can know what our government is doing. So, in, let's say again in hypotheticals, they work out a deal. He comes back, he testifies, he testifies in court, and then he put he puts the system on trial. He puts the government on trial. I think that would be an incredible. It would add to the service he has he has already done. If you want to be generous about it. Jonathan asked me why not, but you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should, should, would there be a value in having him come back and, and face you know, Again, I, I keep going back to this. You know, it's not every sort of point where we look and say somebody has broken the law or even where they're, they come into the criminal justice system um, ends with a trial, and it often doesn't. Um, and so the question is whether there is some way, and I, I, you know, in, in terms of him speaking, him being spoken, you know, asked serious questions, it doesn't seem like Moscow is the best place for that to happen. You know, so if, if we think that there's some benefit into really interrogating him, not in the sense of interrogating somebody in a dark room, but, you know, asking somebody serious hard questions and knowing that you're going to get a non-hedged answer that's not dependent on like who's watching me and who's down the street you know there's 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 also a benefit in in bringing him back here so so in, in even if he doesn't have the documents anymore which he says and even though he's lost control of them um i think you know there's a lot to learn i think that anybody would would say before, before we go, to uh, including you know, the government says again is is that they're not entirely sure of the parameters of this particular leak. Before we yeah, get some questions from from the larger group here, have you been surprised by the government's reaction? Have you been surprised that they've been the government seems to have been fairly passive, right? I, I I've been really surprised by by one aspect of it which is that it turns out that the NSA are, re they're really bad liars. They're not really good at sort of the thing that we expect from politicians and government officials, which is going out and sort of saying something that's kind of, you know, slippery. And in retrospect, you look back and you realize that although you thought it meant one thing, technically they were, <laughs> you know, they've, they've kind of just been really clumsy about it. They've sort of often sort of more than once said something to explain one document that in another document that came out soon after that turned out to just be wrong or, or not true. So the extent that the NSA hasn't in a way had to lie because they've kept so much so secret, um, they seem seem out of practice at it, and that kind of surprised me a little bit. Your spy agency should be good at lying. You would hope that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things. There's nothing else. So so um, well, so I, I was a little surprised by that, and I think that though I think that what people have been most surprised by is the revelation in the president's advisory board has found this, and others have that a lot of the most aggressive data collection didn't actually get them anything. You know, that they had it doesn't seem to have really contributed to keeping us safe. And I think that that I mean I, I don't know that if that, if that personally shocked me, but I think that that really 
surprised, for example, I, I can't remember who, but somebody on the president's advisory board on surveillance said that that was the real surprise for him, the moment when he had a briefing with some intelligence agencies and expected to hear about, you know, dozens of plots that had been foiled and didn't. And he, I'll get his exact words wrong, but he said something to himself like, so what are we doing here exactly? And so I think that that, that for many people has been surprising as well in all of this. Um, I think the NSA is probably very good at lying, just not in public, <laughs> just not exposed in, in, in this way. And also I wonder if they're so clumsy, clumsy um, is because now that they're out in the public and the public's paying attention and lawmakers are paying attention that they could end up um, violating some law. You know, so they might go out and like lie and say, oh, that's not true. And then the piece of paper that they thought was classified and no one had drops and it reveals that they're lying. Well then, yeah, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna look clumsy. But I think the reason why the reaction, um, you call the reaction of the government passive. Um, which is not what, what I was thinking. I, I mean, I thought that the government's reaction is what I thought it would be, which is, you know, they didn't like, they, they don't like what Edward Snowden has done. They're horrified by it. They're freaked out by it because they don't know what, the extent to which what he's done. But it also, I think, the more I thought, the more I thought about it, perhaps the reaction is a reflection of this president. No drama, Obama. This president doesn't, doesn't, Draw the line. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he doesn't. He, rage is not in his yeah. in his DNA. He's not a president who's who will take to the podium and say, "This is a outrageous. This is you know harm national security." There's no heat there when he speaks of Edward Snowden or NSA leaks or anything. It's all very thoughtful. On the one hand, on the other hand, I see, but you know, I mean, that's. The, I mean, if that's passive, okay. But, I mean, that's just, that's the president that we have. Yeah. I, let, let me jump in here and then, then go to Amy on this. But, you know, look at the, look at the English. You know, they, they go to, they, they have long discussions with the Guardian and then make them destroy the one copy of it that they have in the office after they're told, well, there are other copies elsewhere. They then decide that they'll have a, a parliamentary hearing. We received a letter for, you know, to, to you know, we provide answers, which w had a 10-week period for us to think of answers. There's been no sense that there is any sort of emergency, there's any sort of haste. Uh, and yet, yeah, you know, just to, to give the, we were totally on top of this and this was unnecessary and this guy seems sure. awful. And then there have been more and more members of Congress who say, you know, actually I didn't get it, really. You also have members of Congress who are still on television talking about the Russians. But I think that there has actually been um, a surprising phenomenon, I guess you'd call it, of politicians changing their mind on this, which is not something that you would necessarily always, always see. Well, and I think the, the, the survey results we're talking also, it's not as if the public is outraged and so, the government, I think, to some extent, is taking the tone. But the last thing I read before I left, because it hangs by our eleva elevator bank, is the telegraph telegram that was sent by the Mitchell Attorney General's office at the time of the Pentagon Papers. And the last sentence in there, it says, please give the papers back. You would think they would at least ask that much. I mean, even Nixon thought of that, you know. <laughs> Show some interest, folks. <laughs> So with that, um, we'll, we'll take some questions. None of the questions will deal with why did the New York Times not publish the warrantless wireless tapping story in 2004? Uh, <laughs> yes, please. Oh, okay, yeah, is there, can we get a mic? Thank you. Yeah, could you?
you know, that's a great, a great question that we haven't even talked about here, which is whether somebody soon will be having a panel on whether there should be clemency for the Times or the Washington Post or the Guardian um, or their individual reporters. I think that this is a really uh, volatile area of law, and maybe you're, you're obviously the best person to, to speak to it. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I, I think it's hard to, it's really hard to read the, you know, the government's case against Chelsea Manning and, and not sort of say, you know, I could substitute in the name of our magazine, a lot of other things, and feel that, we, that we're vulnerable. I mean, the, the simplistic answer is that no publisher in the entire history of the Espionage Act has ever been prosecuted. That system has worked. The First Amendment works, and, and I don't think that the situation is different, but it's a much longer discussion. Yeah, can you bring the mics over here? Yeah, in the striped shirt there, can you, and then we'll come down here. I, I think that there are a lot of discussions about the definitions of technical implements that we need to have. You know, you often hear from sort of the NSA side that people don't understand how much technology has changed and how much that necess necessitates a change in their mission. And yet, one thing we learned in all of this is that when it suits the NSA, it relies on very pre-computer age definitions as well. For example, the entire telephone metadata program is justified by a 1979 Supreme Court decision about telephones, um, when telephones were something very different. And this is something that Judge Leon wrote about, that basically maybe the word phone in that Supreme Court decision isn't really the same thing, the same even category of thing that we're talking about when we talk about phones now. So looking at a phone record of in this case that everything is based on, this 1979 Supreme Court case in terms of collecting telephone metadata involving one burglar who, you know, was spotted in a car and one telephone line that a policeman sort of stood there listening to. Um, and how exactly does that apply to the collection of things like location data, texts, alerts, you know, everything that we now get on our, our phone. So in other words, I think that the NSA, it has to work both ways, that discussion. If they say we have to have a talk about our capabilities and what we're allowed to do in terms of new technology, then they have to stop relying on laws that define the technology very, very differently as well. Let's get a couple, let's get a couple more questions in here and then we'll call it a night.
Oh, you know, I actually love Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, know. you want to step in on whistleblowers? Um, I read that too. I, 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 I saw his quote. And um, okay, if the Whistleblower Protection Act doesn't, although he does, you read it there. He says, read the thing about um, about not being covered, because there is some hedging in in where the contractors are covered. Yeah. Right, but he, yeah. minimal protections. And what's the next the next line? There are so many holes in the laws protecting state afforded to engage in the process of reporting they provide of self protection and that they appear to be intended to discourage reporting of suspicious wrongdoing. And that's the thing that where he says it, the protections they provide are so weak. So that tells me that there are protections in there, but now I want to go back and see, well, what exactly what exactly are they? Um, but I, you know, again, I still go I still go back to if what Edward Snowden has done is of such import and um, is so monumental to our national discourse and, and what we're debating, which I think is true. There, I would have to believe that members of Congress, if he had gone up to Senator Wyden or any of these folks and said, this is what I've got, and the Whistleblower Protection Act doesn't exactly cover me, we've got, can we, is there some way we can, figure, we can figure this out? Because I have to believe, yeah, there are plea deals and things that are done all the time. Sometimes trials don't happen because people figure out a way to not go to trial. I would have to believe that there, was, that there was a way, there could have been a way, and who knows, there might still be a way for Edward Snowden to come forward and still be held accountable, but not be um, um, and, not, and not be, what's the word I'm looking for? Waterboarded. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not waterboarded or tortured, but I, I mean, hopefully you know where you hopefully you know where I'm going. I mean, if there are holes there, Snowden, what he's doing um, is so important that I would think that Congress would figure out a way to allow him to do it. All right, last question, then we're gonna have to call it night. Uh, somebody up there. Right, I understand your question. And, and again, I mean, you know, I am upfront and open about sort of how <clears throat> conflicted I am about this. I haven't, con I, you know, I don't think I said that he was a, a whistleblower. I said if, I mean, what he did was very important. And he will even say, and he has said in many interviews, what I have done is very important. What I have done is monumental. And there's no denying that what he has done um, has sparked a, de a debate that has been good for the country. But I haven't gotten all the way there to say he's a whistleblower and therefore he should be, he should be um, protected in the sense made immune from prosecution slash being held accountable. And I always go back to, I think, he needs to be held accountable, however that ultimately is defined, 
for what he's done. Karen, back, yeah, back to you. Before we um, conclude and thank our panelists, it's amazing that the word accountability is what we heard more than any other word tonight and how appropriate for our next event, which is uh, next Thursday <laughs> um, at uh, 5.30, I believe, not 6 o'clock, when we will be discussing among other things, accountability and torture, because John Rizzo, who is a general counsel, uh, acting general counsel for the uh, CIA, will be here to discuss um, what he talks about uh, in his book, The Company Man, which discusses, among other things, the torture memos. So I invite you back for that. But for tonight, thank you so much for participating. Thank our panelists. It was a wonderful evening. <laughs>